Sean, I'm not seeing any participants uh, yet. When are, are they on a different channel? They're about to get in, Prof. Oh, I see they're coming now. Great. Yeah, piling in. Fantastic. You may start, Prof. Dolatsky. Good afternoon, everyone, and good morning and good evening to friends around the world. Um, it's my pleasure to, um, well, firstly, let me introduce myself. My name's Professor Barry Dolatsky, the uh, Director of Innovation Strategy at Wits University. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to this uh, uh, webinar on um, science and innovation. And the topic today is on problem solvers and innovators. We believe that innovators are problem solvers. And our speaker today is um, um, uh, Dr. David Fine, who is currently sitting in Florida in the USA. So good morning to you, David. And we are very privileged to uh, firstly welcome our vice chancellor, Professor Zeblan Vilakazi, who will, uh, will uh, talk for a few minutes and um, firstly introduce uh, David, but also make a very important announcement. So if I can hand over to our Vice Chancellor, Professor Zeblan Vilakazi, thank you. Uh, thank you, Barry, uh, and program director, colleagues, members of the best university community. Uh, the team that organized this, uh, friends located in Australia, all over the world, United States, good morning, good day, and good afternoon, and good evening. Um, I will start by saying that if you look at history, innovation just doesn't come from giving people incentives. It comes from creating an, an environment where their ideas can connect. That's according to Stephen Johnson, the science author and media th theorist. I repeat just one last part. Innovation comes from creating environments where ideas can connect. And this is right at the heart of what this very auspicious today, this auspicious occasion is about today. And this is largely attributed to Dr. David Fahn, one of Vets's great sons and, alum and, 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 and alumnus and champions of our moonshot vision. Thank you, David and Angela Fine. This university has taken a quantum leap into the future with the establishment of the Angela and David Fine Chair in Innovation. It's a very generous donation of $3 million into an endowment fund to support innovation at VETS and to create a long lasting legacy of upliftment, forward thinking and relevance. With this chair, a key component of our strategy for the next 10 years, the VETS 2030 vision, which is the moonshot vision, hence the rocket behind me, 
as a symbolic uh, show of what our ambitions are for the next 10 years to change the face of this country and this continent. We need to harness and develop the transition from research excellence to impactful and relevant innovation that will advance society. The holder of this chair, as Professor Puktolaski mentioned, will become the director of the recently established Best Innovation Center, otherwise known as WIC, certainly not a weak link in this chain of innovation. And this center will be the centerpiece of our, best, of our very ambitious best innovation strategy. David and Angela, we are grateful for your generosity and we call you our own son. Your biography reads like a script of science fiction movie. I mean, you told me about having borne witness to rocket launches. I'm jealous because that was a little bit before my time. Um, you've got many years in high technology, chemistry-based instruments from research through production into commercialization, which is very exemplary. You have got a lot to learn from you and you are proud of your achievements. Just under a year ago, you shared some thoughts with us at a webinar we had with you on what to describe as a single most critically important step in innovation was. All you did was to distill it to, down to one key statement you made. I quote, finding the right problem to work on and solve. Be obsessed with the problem. I could not agree with you more. The statement I opened up with as my preamble to your to you to, to to my presentation share it reflects of what you shared with us on some of the impact your research and curiosity brought forth with your innovations are just some of the thinkings that underpins the ethos of this chair how to create an enabling environment for innovation to thrive the list goes on colleagues i won't bore you with details but I just like to say that with more than 97 field patents and uh, multiple solutions to sales well over 1 billion US dollars, as well as formulation of several successful corporate companies, David has set a fine epitome of what the successful and the prolific innov innovation is all about. You've set us a very high crossbar, but certainly it is a moonshot challenge that you've invested in and then for sure live up to your expectations. With those few words, I'd like to hand over to you, Perry, Program Director. And again, thank you. And over to you. Thank you very much, Vice Chancellor. Um, I would uh, like, and this talk isn't about what I've got to say, but I would like to say a few words just to put the um, context of the chair that we've just announced um, clearly. So can I uh, just check if people can see my slide? Yes, we can, Prof. Yeah, thank you. So um, we've uh, developed in the last um, six to nine months a VIS innovation strategy. And uh, the strategy is really about uh, creating the next 100 years for VIS. So we see VIS as a hub that connects universities in the global south to those in the global north. So that is the role and the destiny of our university over the next 100 years. And key to this is the, the, the uh, notion of innovation. So that sees itself as the leading edge of innovation that serves society. It's not innovation for the sake of innovation, but our slogan that says "Vits for good. And this is about how innovation will serve society. And we see Vits playing a key role as a hub that links innovation ecosystems at many universities uh, those in the global north and those in the global south. And our mission is that WITS will strive to meet society's needs by turning, turning knowledge into impactful solutions. We've uh, defined innovation very broadly. So people should not think that this is all about 
uh, scientists and engineers uh, producing uh, widgets and startup companies, although that is part of it, but it is more broadly about being the successful deployment of new ideas or, men or methods to benefit um, society. And then there are more aspects of this, including that we see innovation as something that can be taught and learned, and uh, something that we all will focus on conducting in an ethical manner. Um, with their different uh, types of innovation, and I've had several very um, stimulating and interesting discussions with David about the difference between research-led and researcher-led innovation. And this little graphic shows that on the left of the slide, we have um, the normal, uh, let's call it the normal research cycle, where we start with questions that might be based on curiosity, but could also be based on perceiving needs within society. And then that goes through a research process and leads to research outputs. And uh, those are things that we typically do at, at uh, many universities where we produce new knowledge in the form of papers and higher degrees. What WITS hopes to do is go beyond papers and higher degrees to look for ways to apply that research through an innovation support ecosystem. The, um, um, the, the, the uh, part at the bottom are uh, solutions that seek application. So we do the research and we look at ways that that research might be applied. The much more powerful and the thing uh, David has done particularly well is the top loop where he, he starts off with a problem in search of a solution, and he's going to talk more about that. And that's researcher-led innovation. And that then leads to, to, to those benefits that we hope to see in society. To do this, and I won't bore you with the um, details, but at the heart of our innovation ecosystem lies a new center, which we call in the WITS Innovation Center, which will coordinate innovation activities at WITS and work in partnership with others. And it will, um, it will also offer things like seed funding, um, innovation fellowships to support, to link postgraduate research and undergraduate research into innovation. Very importantly as point C, which will be various industry solutions labs where uh, companies and, and uh, broader society will bring problems that will then be um, co-developed through research and innovation into useful uh, products, services, and outputs to society. We also have an entrepreneurship clinic and many outreach and um, educational activities. And then a corporate program where uh, corporates can find ways to sponsor and support this, this innovation ecosystem. Um, we as well um, see an intermediary between those innovators and the WIC through uh, domain-specific ecosystems in areas such as fintech, medical tech, education tech, government tech, and others. So those are things that we will um, talk about and refine um, in the uh, coming months. And uh, to just uh, stress then, so at the heart of it all is this WITS Innovation Center and the director of the WITS Innovation Center and effectively the person driving a lot of the innovation activity at WITS will be the holder of the chair that's been, that's been funded by Angela and uh, David Fine. So we are very, very excited to, um, um, to see this put in place. It's really going to be the linchpin in terms of how we carry innovation forward. So uh, that's to just put it in context, but I think we've all come to hear um, David talk about what he's done in his long and distinguished um, career 
as an innovator and a researcher. I just want to make one comment before I hand over to David, and it's a, a personal story. So um, in um, December, on the 21st of December, 1988, I was living and working um, in the UK. And I was working as a um, researcher on a project that involved partners across Europe. And we, uh, uh, and my team and me tr uh, traveled to a meeting in Frankfurt. And 21st of um, December, wanting to get back to London by Christmas, we took a plane from London to, from Frankfurt to Heathrow. Uh, we landed at Heathrow safely. The flight was Pan American 103. So we took that plane It flew from Frankfurt to Heathrow. It took off from Heathrow and blew up over Scotland. So in fact, I was on the flight and luckily maybe it, it didn't reach the height or who knows what, but I survived. But for a long time, I was terrified of flying and to find a person who has who invented technology that made flying safer, where plastic explosives could be detected, really puts my, put my mind at rest uh, to know there was a solution. So it's such an honor and a privilege to be welcoming David Fine to this. And um, I just uh, personally, I've, I've kind of never shared that story, but it's uh, something that I, I, I kind of think a lot about when I think about the work um, David has done. So we did have a wonderful introduction from the Vice Chancellor, and I'd now like to welcome uh, Dr. David Fine, who will talk about problem solvers as innovators. Thank you, David, all yours. Thank you, Barry. Thanks for that introduction. And it's a pleasure to be talking to the Woods community. Uh, let me start by dispelling some myths about innovators. Uh, people think innovators must be geniuses or super intelligent people with phenomenal memories. Absolute nonsense. Other people believe that innovators are childhood prodigies. Again, total nonsense. Take me as an example. I failed first grade and I did very poorly at school. Yet later on, I learned how to innovate. Another myth is that you have to be highly knowledgeable about your subject. Couldn't be uh, more incorrect. The more the person knows about their narrow little subject, the more brainwashed they are because they know so much, they've got nowhere to turn and they're stuck, they can't innovate. It's important to have knowledge in a broad base, but not more and more knowledge about your small, small field. We're all born with the innate ability to innovate. Five-year-old kids playing in a sandbox are innovating and playing imaginary games with toys and blocks and paints and they're pretending to fly, they innovate. Every one of us innovates every day in our daily lives. We cook using new recipes. We select what clothes to wear. We decorate our homes. Even uh, sports teams like in soccer and rugby are innovating their next move and strategy to win the next game. So there are a lot of myths about it. In this talk, I'm gonna go over a guide to innovation, how we judge scientists and innovators, and that has to change. Uh, an innovator, you're gonna get backlash, you need to be prepared for it. And then in my, my thoughts on how to apply this to South Africa and everything I'm talking about here is my personal reflections from things I've done. When you tackle a new topic, the best way to do that I have found is to read enough to understand it and then stop. Do not become an expert yet, just read for, and today with Google, it may be a day or two, understand the problem and then stop, then go and think about it. Solve the problem. You're not an expert, but you can solve it. And you may find half a dozen possible solutions. Uh, Shunru Suzuki, a then Buddhist monk, uh, it's a very famous quote. In the beginner's mind, there are many possibilities, but in the experts, there are few. So 
So you're a beginner and you've got lots of possibilities and your mind hasn't been blocked by all these other things that a lot of knowledge would, would tell you. Once you've worked out what you think are the solutions, then go and read the literature, then become the expert. And before you actually proceed with your work, you've got to really know your subject. And I guarantee you, every time I've done this, I, and it's going to happen with you, you'll find new ways which others have not thought of just because your mind hasn't been blocked out by everything you've read. Let me give you an example. Uh, we had uh, developed a sniffing capability for the beverage industry. They were concerned with refillable plastic bottles, bottles like this, which get refilled. They're not glass, they're plastic. And when you wash them, you can get everything out, but the plastic holds onto some things like if the bottle had been sitting around for a long time and mold had developed, you don't want to refill that, wash and refill that bottle or whatever else may be there. So we had developed the sniffing capability, but now we're at the sampling point and the beverage company we were working with were very concerned. We, yeah, we'd solved the, the detection problem. How do you sniff a bottle? And a sniffing machine we were told was a well over a million dollars, very expensive and very complicated. And I was puzzled by this and I, they wanted to tell me about it. I said, no, let me think about it first. And a few days later, I was washing the dishes and opened the faucet tap to quickly, water shot into a cup that still had some coffee in it. And I got coffee all over my face. It was a eureka moment for me. I was laughing because now I knew how to sample from a bottle. You, instead of putting it through a big machine, we would just lean over the line blow air jets. As the bottles came by, we had an air jet. The air went in, swirled around, and everything in the bottle came flying out, and we sampled just behind the bottle. So no special machine, just leaning over the line. And based on the speed of the line, we knew which bottle was bad, and we could put a ram on and, and knock it off. The industry was kind of startled. You know, this is moving at 12 bottles a second, 750 uh, a minute. And they tried it out and it worked. And within you know, six months, we were shipping machines with this capability around the world. 18 months later, I was at Oktoberfest in Munich, where it was a big show of the beverage industry. And I saw one of these machines, 15 feet in diameter, all stainless steel, 10 feet tall, grabbed the bottle, put a probe in it. As this bottle went clicking around 100 stations and the most magnificent piece of machinery I'd ever seen. Clicking and clacking, millisecond precision, it was gorgeous. And I realized that if I had seen that before, there's no way in the world I would have thought I could have done it simpler and in a different way. Maybe I would have uh, made it slightly smaller or something, but no way would have I radically changed it. This is an example that I felt, was, and it's been with me for a long time. Uh, there's no way I would have thought of just blowing air in the bottle and sniffing it and not building a machine, just lean over the line. And in fact, I've sometimes wondered what other very complex machines do we have today, which is probably maybe a very much simpler solution. In innovating, one of the key things you have to do is grasp the key fact of a problem and then focus on it and solve it. And to train yourself to do that, I used to read a paper or sometimes a, or watch a movie or something and summarize it in just a couple of paragraphs or a page. And that forced me to focus on what was the key issue that they were putting across there. One of my brightest uh, engineers I had working with me, a brilliant chemist, uh, I asked him to summarize a two-page interesting paper I'd seen. And his summary of the two pages was 10 pages. He went from two and he summarized it into 10. He could not prioritize. He was so brilliant and he had such a good memory. Everything they did, he thought, well, maybe they didn't consider this and they didn't consider that and they should have done this. And he couldn't prioritize. He could not innovate. Brilliant scientist. And he, when he left me to he went to a major university in the Boston area and published a lot of papers. And he's, he's a very successful and well-known and well-respected professor. And he's very good at writing papers. But as an innovator, 
he couldn't innovate because he saw all these problems and he couldn't focus on where he was going. And it made me realize there are two kinds of scientists, those who publish and extend knowledge, which is how science grows. It's a major part of science. And then the very few who innovate. And they're different kind of people. And it's my contention that South Africa needs more of those innovators today than uh, a few more, because there's only a small percentage, maybe less than a fraction of a percent become innovators. And we, we just need to increase that a little bit. Innovators, their knowledge has to be broad. I said before, don't focus just on your topic, get broad in your, in your uh, thinking. And I'm going through some very personal examples. I have a, PA, uh, a, a BS honors degree from Wits in chemistry. My PhD was in leaves in combustion and thermal explosion chemistry. Uh, when I was on the MIT faculty, I was working on air pollution chemistry, which was primarily the formation of nitric oxide NO, how, to, how it's formed, how to detect it. And I built the first chemiluminescent analyzer to measure it. I'd left MIT and I was working for a small research company in the Boston area. And uh, a visitor over lunch told me about compounds called nitrosamines, which were highly carcinogenic, a few parts per million dose to a, a lab, a mouse or a rat would cause cancer uh, several years later. And I didn't know what a nitrosamine was. He drew it for me and it's got an N, NNO bond. And I looked at that and it was almost like I, I had a high. I was, it was my first eureka moment. I knew because I'd published some papers on bond energies that that NNO bond would be weak. I knew all about you know, nitric oxide. I knew how to detect it. And I realized this is gonna be the easiest of all compounds to detect. It was serendipity. I just had this funny background. And I developed a special instrument for detecting nitrosamine. It was fun. It, was, it blew the field open. It was exciting. And uh, in a very short time, I published an awful lot of papers. By the time I was 40 in 1982, uh, I had published over 100 papers, most of them in this field. I had lots of research funding, but I found it boring. Instead of developing in, uh, exciting new things, I was working on what is the nitrosamine potential from finfish versus uh, shellfish. And you know, it wasn't very exciting anymore. And I made a conscious effort. This was not for me. I'm going to call it quits in this field. I want to be in developing new things, not uh, publishing more and more papers and learning more and more about less and less. And this led to the invention of many new products. I had fun again. As, uh, as was mentioned before, the sales of things I developed, uh, the order of a billion dollars and employed uh, many people, over a thousand people. And it would not have happened if I had stayed in that narrow field. And, and I want to go through some of these because it, it zigzag a little bit and it tells you you do something and you change fields and it uh, helps you with a previous problem you had and you can dance around a little bit, but everything leads to something new, particularly if it's an unusual combination. I knew about nitrosamines and how to measure them. And when I was at, before I'd left South Africa, I worked at African explosives with Modifantine on with explosives, just learning a little bit about them. My PhD was in explosion chemistry. So it was a natural for me to say, can I detect explosives, plastic explosives? Explosives have NO2 groups, carbon to NO2, nitrogen to NO2, oxygen to NO2. And we, the first thing we developed that was really practical was a forensic analyzer. And uh, we could detect trace amounts of even plastic explosives after the bomb had gone off. And in December 88, that uh, flight that Barry referred to, the Pan Am flight, was blown up over Lockerbie. And it was the first time our equipment was used, and it was successfully used, to determine what the explosives were in that bomb. It turned out to be PET and an RDX and Semtex, the plastic explosives. In 1988, 
uh, 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 ICBM in the United States in Arkansas, uh, there was a leak of the rocket fuel and it blew up in the silo and threw a huge hydrogen bomb many miles in the explosion. And suddenly there was a need to sniff better. The rocket fuel is made of N2O4, the oxidizer, that's dinitrogen tetroxide, and hydrazine, which is similar to nitrosamines in structure. So it was a natural to develop the, and win the contract to develop that leak detector. Once we were doing uh, high speed sniffing, when the beverage industry introduced their refillable plastic bottle, uh, we were able to work with them and develop high speed sniffing techniques where it didn't take a minute or 30 seconds, but we could do it in real time, very high speed sniffing of anything that wasn't the beverage. And that became a very large business for us. We equipped all factories of, of many of all the beverage companies around the world who were using plastic refillable bottles. Since I was working with the beverage industry, I got to know their executives and uh, one of them left to join a beer company and called me up one day to say they had a problem with full height in a beer can. If they put in a drop too little, they were fined by the consumer groups in California for shortchanging the customer. And if they put in a drop too much, they weren't paying enough alcohol tax. They were in a quandary that needed more, more uh, accuracy. Well, I'd been around x-ray machines at airports. I knew how the x-ray machines worked and realized I could put a fan beam, an array of detectors. And if I moved the array further back, I could get exquisite accuracy. And we developed a full height for the beer can industry. And we were able to tell not only the full height very accurately, we could correct for beer in the foam and see whether the can was on, the can lid was on properly, if it was bulging or not, so there was a leak. Uh, that became a product still sold today. Because of uh, my interest in explosives, I naturally started thinking about detection of buried landmines. And we built a fast sniffing machine to sniff TNT. The hardware worked, but the approach was a dismal failure. Uh, when you've got a mine in the ground and TNT vapor is coming out of the mine, uh, depending on the soil topography, the slope of the ground, if there's a rock nearby or a weed, the high density of the vapor could be a foot or more away from the mine. And so it's useless as a mine detector because you'd have stepped on the mine. And it got me thinking into other ways of potentially finding mines, and we went to ground penetrating radar and metal detection. Fused those two technologies, and that is now the US Army mine detector. And many thousands of those are, have been built and used, particularly it was, it was ready for the American invasion of Afghanistan and Iraq. If we could do radar using cell phone frequencies could be used to uh, find a little object in the ground, could we see through walls? Uh, cell phones penetrate a building. So obviously the, 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 the radiation gets through and that became through wall radar capability for finding people. So before you enter a building, particularly a soldier, they knew if there were people hiding and where they were. Uh, Later on, I, in 2000, found that this NO molecule that I've been playing with for so long was a drug. And it got approved by the FDA for the treatment of pulmonary hypertension, particularly in newborns. And that got me interested in how were they doing it? And they were shipping the NO in big gas bottles, uh, three feet, four feet tall, weighing about 100 pounds. Uh, some of them slightly smaller, some, some bigger and uh, started to look at that and said, wait a minute, this is crazy. That N2O4 is really two molecules of NO with oxygen. Uh, just over half a cc was the same amount of NO as in this giant gas bottle. And so I started a company to, to do that and we got FDA approval in 2019 for that approach where it's now something so small you can put it in your pocket and walk around it. And I just want to go, I went through this to show you this zigzag background and how it helps you solve problems and get onto the next one. And once you're in it, the more diverse you can get, the better it is because your background and doing things in this way 
is something other people just would never have done. And that helps enormously. Going back to what an innovator must do, they have to be correct every single time. As an innovator, if you blow it once and you say you can do something and it can't or it doesn't work, your reputation is shot and people won't believe you the next time. So what I used to do was every time we did a, something, it was, uh, the results were potentially challengeable, checked every calibration. If I used chemicals, I would get them from two supply houses, just in case there was an impurity in one. I check every equation, every formula. Units were a common one where people make mistakes. You get confused with units in different countries. I'd repeat the entire experiment with different apparatus if I could, different people. It was important enough I'd do it myself, but coming over a long weekend and run the whole thing myself personally. Your data has to be ironclad. Your work must be repeatable. There's just no ifs and buts about that. If you're a researcher, you can retract a paper, you can survive. If you're an innovator, you can't do that. You have to be right every single time. And you have to have absolute knowledge that you're right so you can stand up and when people are horrified at what you've proposed or done and are calling you all sorts of names, you can sit back and let them call you names, but you know you're right and they're wrong. Let me give you an example of that. Uh, I had a colleague eat a bacon and lettuce and tomato sandwich, and he washed it down with a beer, and we looked at the blood, bits of blood samples from the arm, and we could see the dimethyl nitrosamine that will go up and down after the meal. Made kind of sense because bacon and nitrite was considered uh, potentially reacting in the stomach to form the nitrosamine, but it made no sense because it was well known that nitrosamines in the blood had never been seen, and they were metabolized by the uh, liver in a single pass. I told some of my colleagues and other organizations what we had done, and I was called insane, crazy, stupid, impossible, there must be something wrong. And I told them I was actually submitted the paper, I submitted it to the journal of Nature. They were horrified. A consultant who worked for me resigned. He didn't want to be associated with such insanity. And we battled with the editor, the reviewers had a fit, but we finally got it published because the reviewers couldn't find fault with our method, how we did it or anything else. The data was just, they said was garbage. Well, I had to say to the editor, well, are you not gonna publish a paper because you don't like the, the data and no one can find any fault with it, you've got to publish. The paper got published and uh, within a day or two, a colleague of mine that I got to know well in Germany called me up and said, David, I've done this experiment and I didn't see it. I asked him what he'd done. He said he'd had uh, you know, the bacon and lettuce and tomato sandwich uh, for breakfast and he didn't, didn't find it. And I said, Rolf, did you have beer? He said, no, I don't have beer with breakfast. I said, Rolf, repeat it exactly because I've repeated it and I found it. Two days later, he called me back all excited. He found it. Got the same result. Well, the outcome of this was pretty dramatic. It was found that beer contained the nitrosamine. It wasn't from the bacon, it was in the beer. We checked all different alcoholic beverages, and the only other alcoholic beverage that had it was scotch. The clue was malt. They both made from malt. How do you, how is malt made? You take barley, you germinate it, you get the rootlets, and then you uh, remove the water and you dry it. And I went out to a malting facility. They, they threw me out in the, to the Midwest because there was a real problem now with, with beer. And I just took one look at the operation. Uh, what they were doing was they were taking combustion products and using the combustion products to flow through the bed to dry it. Well, happened to have a combustion background and an NO background. You knew that NO was formed in that combustion. You formed NO2. The NO2 would, would form nitrite and you were nitrosating right whatever amines were on the barley root. Go to indirect firing. And uh, that solved the problem for those two industries. Just one visit going there, not by brilliance, but just I had a crazy background. I was an atrosamine chemist who had a combustion background. Serendipity is, is very important. The other issue was uh, 
how did it get through the liver? That wasn't my territory. It was done by other people uh, around the world who quickly repeated the work. And it, they came to recognize that the alcohol was overwhelming the liver. And the few parts per million of nitrosamines was getting through because the liver was busy metabolizing the nitrosamine. And that led to obviously many new areas of why alcohol is a co-carcinogen, but not a, doesn't cause cancer by itself, but it, it, it enhances other exposures. A counterintuitive <clears throat> item with an innovator is if things are going well and all your experiments are working, you're in trouble, beware. For a researcher, that's fine. You, you, you can publish all that work, but if you're someone in innovation, you learn from your failures. Why did it fail? What are the lessons? What steps? What happened here? Why is my theory wrong? And I found that when things were going well, we weren't innovating. And I would review my uh, scientists and I'd call him into the office and someone would come in. I remember one occasion, the person was very proud of what he had done, everything had worked, and he'd even published a few papers. And I said to him, you're not cut out to do this work. He was just startled beyond imagination. And I said, you're not pushing your limits. You're not thinking boldly enough. You're not prepared to go beyond what you know is good. You've got to think beyond that. Uh, many of my people, uh, responded to that and did well. Some couldn't cope with that and moved on. When you innovate, you've got to know when to stop improving and ship. And uh, this is a very important, I call it the perfection trap. Uh, just think where we'd be if Bill Gates was still, was still perfecting Microsoft Outlook. Uh, we wouldn't have the personal computers today because they wouldn't be an operating system. Or just think where Apple would be if they waited for all the features of an iPhone 13 before they shipped their first iPhone. If it's better than what's out there and there's a market for it and you can sell it, it's ready to ship or, it's, or declare it a success and move on to your next version too. But uh, know when to stop. And many, re many people in, in research and innovation don't know when to stop. It's very important to get that lesson. Scientists are judged <clears throat> throughout the world in every country by the number of papers they publish. You're promoted at a university by that. Your funding comes from that. And our best and brightest researchers focus on publishing more and more. When I was dependent on research funds and grants, I too became a factory for research papers. And Innovation would happen, but we didn't have too much time for that. We, to win the next grant, we had to publish more than our competition, so we, we published like crazy. For innovators, the number of papers you publish is the wrong currency. It means absolutely nothing. You can't measure success of an innovator by the number of papers they publish. In, in my, the, the time I, I was 40, I'd, I'd published all those papers. In the next uh, 38 years, I published only 50 papers, very few. If I was being judged by papers, I would have couldn't be considered a failure. Papers are, to an innovator, papers about as are relevant as much as how much coffee you drink. They had no meaning. Number of patents is a better choice. It has, two has problems. I've now published over 100 patents. Uh, issued patents in, in my name. Number of new jobs created is important. Number of new businesses you've started, the help you've given to industry. And we need to recognize this, particularly at a university, and encourage potential innovators, not uh, penalize them. If you're innovating and you're working on innovative projects, don't expect that person to also be uh, publishing a lot of papers. You can't have both. If you want uh, people who publish papers, then you're stifling your innovation. And you have to have a dual track, recognize people who are innovating and not penalize them because they're not publishing as much as their, as their peers. This is a very important aspect for particularly, uh, say, in South Africa at least. You'll get backlash. Uh, 
Uh, it works in practice, but not in theory. You may have heard of that. It works in practice, but not in theory. People and scientists are totally in belief that uh, theories are the ultimate culmination of modern knowledge. You come, along, you come along as an innovator and you propose something which is counter to that, or you've actually got something working which is counter to that, or you've got data which is counter to that, and people go instinctively negative. I've been called incompetent, stupid, crazy, an ignoramus, a charlatan, a trickster, a son of a bitch, just everything. And it's happened to me not once, but over a dozen times. And it happens when you just disrupt the very powerful egos of people who've made it to the top in their field. And you've got to be prepared and know it's coming that these visional, vicious social attacks and realize they can be devastating if you're not prepared for it. If you're innovating, it will happen. It's part of life. And it, they can be very vicious, including canceling your funding, attempts to kick you out of professional societies, all sorts of things. Let me give you a couple of examples. In 1975, we were uh, in the nitrosamine field and World Health had organized a round robin study with uh, cans of meat gone around to all the major labs in the world, anyone who wanted it, to analyze and tell them which can had the nitrosamine, which can, um, what nitrosamines were in each can and what the concentration was. None of the labs were able to do any of those things, except my lab. We got it all right. I was very proud of that and uh, we became known for that. And uh, the way we had done it was we'd added mineral oil to the sample. Meat is lunch, which was a can of meat, and it was fats and oils and greases and uh, water. Everything was in there. And I got a notification a month later that our contract with NIH was being canceled because of my incompetence and my stupidity. We asked for a, a meeting and uh, I was told I was incompetent and stupid because who would add mineral oil to a sample? It was not an approved reagent. Every batch was slightly different. It showed absolute total incompetence. No one in their right mind would ever do that. And now I had to say unreasonable, yes. And conventional, yes, but we succeeded and all the others failed. So it certainly wasn't stupid. And I quoted uh, Bernard Shaw, George Bernard Shaw. You may have heard this quote, the reasonable man adapts himself to the world. The unreasonable one persists in trying to adapt the world to himself. Therefore, all progress depends on the unreasonable man. Yes, we were unreasonable. Yes, we weren't in our right minds, but we, solved the problem. We got our contract back and that sort of thing has happened to me just so many times. Another example of this sort of thing, uh, first time I uh, had realized we could do explosive detection, I put a simple apparatus together, a breadboard in our lab and showing we could detect PETN and RDX, the two explosives in uh, plastic explosives. And a senior government scientist came to our facility. I invited him and he, I showed him the machine working and he worked it. And he went away and wrote me a note saying it was what he had seen was mathematically impossible. I was there for a charlatan and a fraudster. Uh, and he completely discredited me and the technology. The trouble was his assumptions were wrong. It was garbage in and his garbage out was projectile diarrhea. It was a disaster. He was wrong by insensitivity by about a factor of a million. But that trip report stayed in insecure government uh, circles. I didn't know about it. He, I didn't realize he hadn't uh, written it up and included my response. And it delayed explosive detection in the US uh, in airport security for about 15 years. We eventually uh, got exonerated uh, in 1994. This mathematically impossible explosive detector won the highly prestigious Presidential Design Award for Excellence in the United States, which was presented by President Clinton at the White House. But it took a long time before we were able to overcome that disaster. Solutions 
seeking a problem is the opposite of a problem seeking a solution. Let me give you an example. Uh, in 79, I developed a simple 3D printing process. Took a, uh, someone had told me about UV cured polymers and I thought about it and took a spray gun and sprayed the head of a pin, flooded it with UV light and built up a, an object on the head of the pin. I built a little toy airplane with a man inside, a joystick, incredible detail because every drop as it landed was curing. And I thought if now, I, instead of a spray gun, I use inkjet technology, which was coming in, uh, which would be, in, this is an incredibly accurate way of making molds and components of all sizes. So the company did a market study. I had this vision of making prototypes, everything else though. And the market study concluded, how many were sold that day, that year, zero. It was the market size, zero. It was the profitability, zero. They killed the project. Today, it's a $26 billion business in the US alone. The problem here was I was too early and I didn't have the ability to follow through on my vision. So beware the solution seeking the problem. It's most common at universities. I've tried it several times and every time I tried it, I failed. I, I couldn't break out of it. It's easiest to start if someone, uh, a professor thinks of a problem in his field and he, and, or thinks of what he's doing and he generates a great uh, solution, but there's no existing problem. And it needs a true visionary with fabulous, not only scientific and engineering, but the business and the financial ability and the organization behind it. It's been done. Steve Jobs at Apple, Elon Musk at SpaceX and Tesla, Bill Gates at Microsoft, Mark Zuckerberg at Facebook, Jeff Bezos. There's a reasonable list of people who've pulled this off, but it's a rare breed. We can't sit back and say we're going to, we're just going to uh, focus on trying to generate the next uh, Elon Musk. It takes this. Uh, such a, it's such a difficult thing to be able to pull that off. An approach to innovation in South Africa, and I want to use this as the, in the conclusion, is the quickest and surest way to innovate is to find the problem and solve it. You have, then you've got an existing need. There's a sales and marketing opportunity you know is going to happen. You know it's going to be commercially successful. You've got to find the right problem. You need to get industry to come to you or you have to have very good contacts with industry to recognize their problem. It doesn't take much capital. And uh, when you're successful, you can spin out small companies or have other companies manufactured and get royalties. Uh, you've got to remember to file patents. And I think if WITS got into this kind of arena where, where I spend much of my time, you'll become known as a place to go problems to be solved. And they not, don't just have to be in science and engineering. They could be in business, could be in any field, in medicine, in architecture. It's not uh, restricted to chemistry and physics. It just happens to be my field of expertise, but it could be in, in, in any field of expertise. And I think if you could do this, it would be unique capability for South Africa. And most importantly of all, by fostering an innovative environment, where innovators are rewarded and not penalized and do this at a major university in South Africa with thousands of new students coming in every year, each one of them with potential innovation. If you have that environment, you may one day breed the next Musk, or Bezos, or Zuckerberg, who can take those very difficult problems you know, with a vision and take them further. But you need that environment of encouraging innovation for that to happen. That's the end of my talk. Thank you. I'm delighted to take questions. Thank you very much, uh, um, David. Thank you, Dr. Fah. Um, I It's uh, so fascinating to listen to you and it, it rings uh, so many bells for us. And um, I think that you modestly say that Witz might produce the next uh, um, Musk or Zuckerberg or Bezos, 
but I hope we produce many more of the next uh, David Fines. So um, I think that you, you, you really are an inspiration to us. Um, we've uh, got a few questions and I will come to them in a second, but I just want to uh, firstly ask you a question of my own and it comes back to the very generous um, donation you've given to BITS to support innovation. And um, it's, it's a kind of interesting that you are, and I think that we might not have made this clear at the beginning, that you uh, did your undergrad and at WITS, you uh, did chemistry, you did your PhD at Leeds University, and then you went to the States, you um, worked and taught at MIT, and then you, 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 you focused on innovation in, the, in the, the corporate world, but you always kept your link to, to research and academia. But um, your uh, donation, which is substantial and will really put innovation on the map for WITS and South Africa, and as I said, in the Global South going forward. It'll uh, give us the resources to focus on doing what we want to do. And I just wonder what you, uh, what message you hope this sends to other WITS alumni who have come through WITS like yourself. I don't think you've had close links to WITS through your career, but you have um, kind of seen the potential of WITS University going forward and you've made this um, generous gift. And I just wonder what message you would send to other WITS alumni in terms of, of, of supporting these kinds of activities uh, going forward. Could you just comment on that? Yeah, sure. Um, I feel by uh, making a gift like this, and I didn't realize I was gonna be one of the first ones, but I wanna encourage other people, other South Africans or former South Africans uh, living around the world, uh, a lot of medical folks, a lot of people in the sciences, in, in finance, in very diverse fields. Uh, let's give something back to this. It's where we went to school, where we were launched in our careers. And uh, if other people can do the same thing, uh, bigger or smaller donations, it doesn't matter. But many people have succeeded who've left this and gone overseas. It'd be a great way to uh, reward WITS for, for launching us, getting us our, our, our first education. So I, I feel very strongly that uh, this should be viewed by others as an example for others to uh, do the same thing. Thank you so much. And I hope that people do take that call. And just to say, this is Witz's centenary. We've had a successful 100 years and we're looking to the next 100. And these kinds of gifts and support, which uh, could be financial or could be in kind, helps us to move forward and play our role. I'll uh, come to some of the questions now. So a question asked was, can innovation competency be taught through formal education? Can you teach innovation? If you'd like to answer that. Yeah, it's a, it's a very difficult question. People have written books on how to innovate. And by merely by writing a book about it, it's not innovation anymore. And they take one person's view as what are the key things. These are the six things you have to do, or three or five or nine. Everybody's unique, they built differently, but I think you can encourage innovation uh, by, there's some basic lessons. You've got to learn to focus on a, on a particular problem. <coughs> I found in my case, virtually everything I did was uh, not innovation by a brilliant idea coming into my mind suddenly, but because I had a diverse background. I had done many different things and I could remember what I'd done and pull those together and use it to solve the next problem. Uh, so yeah, we all uh, have a serendipity. Uh, you, you dealt the set of cards and you can start to use that. And I think encouraging innovation, you've got professors at a university and we got to encourage them to think about their field and other fields. I think what's very important in, in, in that I've read is the diversity. 
you can't be an expert in your very narrow field and know it very well and expect it to you to be able to innovate in that field. You've got to branch out into other areas of physics, chemistry, math, architecture, whatever it is you're, you're in. But just don't stay in your very, very narrow field because you're in a situation where you're learning more and more about less and less, and you know, you're not able to, to do anything. You've got to get know enough about other fields to talk to someone in the medical field, to talk to a biologist, to talk to a mathematician. And if you can't converse with them, you're, you're stuck. You've got to have, and it can be self-taught, just got to read a couple of articles or papers or, be, or learn about it. But I, I believe the ability to relate to other people's work is very, very important. Sometimes when I speak to a physician and I ask them about a problem, they'll tell me, um, and it's in medicine, they'll say, oh, I know nothing about that. And I'd say, wait a minute, you're a physician. I, I'm a chemist. Uh, 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 you must, you know, a hell of a lot more about this than I do. And, but they were back in, in their own little speciality of medicine. And others, physicians I've spoken to respond very enthusiastically and we, we have long discussions. And I think it's that ability to open up and understand other fields. And the same thing would apply in chemistry or physics. You, you've got to not just stay in your own narrow, narrow, narrow field and expand a bit. Thank you. That's, um, I think that's great advice. And I, I think that we are, and that's one of the things that we're going to do in this Wits Innovation Center and through the Chair in Innovation. We've um, had a few questions and I'll sort of lump them together. To, to just quickly say that first question was from Cuthbert. Uh, we've got some questions um, that talk about um, the, the um, uh, social sciences. So you, you uh, from science, you're a scientist, um, I'm an engineer, and I think others in the in the in the sciences and engineering might uh, have a stronger um, kind of echo in terms of what you're doing. But uh, what about the social scientists and the artists and people who are not from uh, science and engineering? Um, can they still be problem solvers and can they still be innovators? Can you comment on? on the broader disciplines and how they yes, I feel very strongly that they, they are an artist who paints or, or does a sculptor, sculpting or someone who writes uh, a new book or a poem is every much an innovator as a, as a scientist discovering something new. Uh, they're innovating in their field and that inspiration to innovate, where does it come from? Uh, very likely it's going to come from experiences in their life. And I think uh, something I haven't touched on is the importance of diversity. Uh, not only in the sciences and learning different fields, but cultural diversity. You've grown up in different cultures, different religions, different countries. Uh, if you've uh, grown up a uh, scientist or anyone coming from Russia, China, South Africa, America, UK, if you've got a tough problem when you put all those people together, you're, they look at it from a very different perspective. And, and especially I draw a lot of my, my own inspiration from the social sciences, from the artists. Why, what made that artist do that? That's fabulous. I really like the outcome. And it applies across the board and I think in your innovation center, you need to have people from the social sciences in some of those meetings about a technical subject because they can add inspiration. They may not solve the problem directly, but their inspiration will trigger someone else to think and together you're gonna to solve this problem where they contribute as much as, as, as the scientists because they think differently and they're much more in tune with innovation. I mean, artists, by their very nature, uh, are not just repeating the same pictures every time. They kind of create new things. And therefore, they they as close to innovators as you can get. Thank you. And I just have to say that 
that uh, one of the first activities through the VIS Innovation Center and the first usage of, of your, your generous gift has been to create some postdoctoral fellowships in innovation to get uh, postdocs looking at innovation. And one of those is going to go to a joint uh, project between our School of Art, which is a very acclaimed School of Art in, in the world, and our department, our School of Physics. So one of our top physicists is going to host in his lab an artist who will sit in that physics lab and help to interpret some of the science. So um, I hope we live up to that, but I think we, we certainly believe in what you've said. Uh, there's a question from Professor Nathia Chetty, who's our Dean of Science, and he's asking, uh, he, he, he states, as we've all heard, that you've accomplished a lot in your lifetime. And to what extent did, the, did you rely on the work of others, on experts, to solve your problem? You uh, speak of teamwork. I, I hear you say we a lot rather than I. And uh, to what extent is teamwork important? Or are people who do innovation working alone and developing their, old idea, their own ideas? So could you talk about teams versus the individual? I think the days of the individual are, are rare. Everything I've done, even if it's, I've started with an idea, I've needed a team to execute it. I wouldn't have been able to execute it if it hadn't been for that team of knowledge. And sitting together with others where uh, they all know if they contribute, they're going to get their name on the patent. They're going to get their, uh, they're going to get recognized. So they're willing to jump in with ideas. And, uh, yeah, I've guided a lot of that, but the other part of that is you recognize that team. I say we, most of my patents have multiple authors. And in some cases, they were the key in breaking open uh, a particular area. They had an idea out of nowhere. Uh, let me give you sort of the kind of example. Uh, we were converting nitrogen dioxide, NO2, into NO. And the classical way of doing it is you heat it to about 600 degrees over uh, in a uh, degree centigrade over stainless steel, or you can do it at a catalyst like molybdenum at about uh, 350 degrees. And one of our people said, wait a minute, uh, antioxidants, let's take vitamin C. What happens if we just pass it over vitamin C? You want the vitamin C, remove the oxygen. And if you try it by bubbling through a solution of vitamin C, yeah, it does a little bit. But we put the vitamin C on the on um, silica gel with a large surface area, and we got 100% conversion. Well, that came from someone not an expert in the field, just asking a naive question. Very, very important that uh, the contribution of others is part of what you do, because that very simple question uh, helped uh, make some devices very practical. And, it, and it's not just innovation in the sciences. I remember we were working with the uh, situation. I was working with the government. They had year-end money, and that uh, was the last day of the financial year, and we had to sign a contract. Uh, the government wanted to give us money to build some machines, and uh, we were anxious for the funds, which was several million dollars. And uh, we all came to agreement, and then they said, you've got to give the government rights in your technology. And we said, no, we can't do that. And they understood because uh, everyone would compete with us if we gave the government rights. And we came to an impasse. We, you could get around it, but that took a week or two of, of getting approvals. And it was the last day of the fiscal year. The government wanted to award the contract or the money would go back to the treasury. Uh, we wanted the contract. And I asked what I thought was a stupid question. I said, why don't we reverse the contract. Will you give us the money to give you 10 instruction manuals and repair manuals? And with each repair manual and instruction manual you give us, with each set of manuals, we'll give you a free instrument. And you can have all the rights you want in the instruction manual. And they laughed. 
and then thought about it and they went off and spoke to their team and they came back and that's how we got the contract. So it applies across the board in that's in contract negotiation. This sort of different way of thinking, that was the last approach uh, contract negotiator would take. But since I wasn't in contract negotiations and I asked a silly question, it worked. Don't be afraid to ask and try things like that because they, it's not your field, but still you, you know, all they can do is say, no, don't be crazy. But you know, that's an important issue. Um, so to, to just uh, talk um, a bit about, uh, um, a bit more about the team. So you've spoken about your team members and uh, there's there's a, a bigger ecosystem that would support innovation, including collaborators, people sort of outside of your immediate group that you work with, and also uh, mentors. Uh, mentors, um, how do you 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 find mentors and collaborators, and are they important? I never use them. Other people do, it's just, uh, I was too busy doing things and didn't, but I believe it could work. People have come to me and I've mentored other people, uh, people who, particularly those who've worked with me in the past or have known me, and I've advised them uh, sometimes not to do something, sometimes to do something. Invariably, when I've advised them not to, not to invest in something, as an example, they've gone ahead and done it and lost every penny they had. Uh, you you get to, um, so I've done very little of that, but it's not because it's it's a good or bad way to go. It's just, I've done it another way. Yeah. So um, I think, uh, you know, that, and I think what you've shown is, is that you've drawn on a lot of diversity in your own knowledge and uh, but sometimes people would look outside of their own knowledge to bring in others. Um, uh, one of the things, and you've worked at, um, you've, you've worked and been associated with MIT and other universities, and there's a, a, a tension between um, a publication and innovation. So, um, um, a lot of people feel that research is incentivized at universities and they're huge brownie points to score in doing research. And um, there, there, there tends to be less incentivization around innovation. And um, the, the, the uh, question we've got is uh, how does one, or, or, or kind of how would you suggest we deal with that conflict between research and research outputs that as measured in the classical university way and, um, and something else called innovation, which, and I, 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 I kind of see you've, you've um, treaded both paths. You've been a researcher, you've published papers, you've got the research outputs, but you've also got the, the products and the companies and the patents to prove your innovation credentials. But could you just speak about those tensions in universities between the publish or perish uh, flavor and the innovation flavor? They, the universities haven't handled that very well. A lot of people in the universities, if they're in the innovative kind of mode, they leave and they join a company or start a company because they're not getting recognition at their university. They're publish or perish and they're perishing. They're not getting promoted. The people who are writing a lot of papers are getting promoted and they left behind. I think with your innovation center and the understanding that you have to recognize someone who is innovating and uh, not count the number of papers they've uh, published, but rather the success of their innovation and develop some formula. How many jobs did they create in the last two years? How many companies did they start? Uh, how many patents? Is, patents are at least a better way than papers, although patents have limitations as well. Uh, but we have to find a way to recognize the innovators. And if you've got an innovation center, in that innovation center, you should not be 
promoting people because of papers published, but rather the success of their innovations. So maybe if they're in chemistry or physics or architecture or the arts, whatever subject they're in, if they're part of the innovation center, that should protect them or they should get rewards. And maybe the rewards can be monetary. If they've done something which has led to financial success, let them share in that. Let the people see, wow, this person uh, solved this problem and uh, they got a big prize mm -hmm. or they got recognition. And that will help create this um, uh, environment of innovation is being encouraged as opposed to innovation is discouraged because I didn't publish enough, so therefore I'm not gonna make a professor or I'm not gonna get a promotion. But you've led to something, you know, you've solved some important problems that other people need. Uh, and it's particularly across disciplinary uh, boundaries within the university. For example, if you're working with a medical school and you help uh, someone with a, a problem in the medical field and you, you saw something together, uh, I found when I was at university, uh, even when I was at MIT, by helping someone in another field, when it came time for uh, discussions about promotion, uh, people didn't know you. You were known in other departments, but not in your own department. And that was, you're encouraged therefore not to collaborate with other people because it didn't help you. And I think, but having a innovation center, just having it, and one of the reasons I wanted to, to inspire this was you've got to find a realistic way to reward people differently. For example, yeah. the person who's going to head up this innovation center, uh, if they're successful and they develop uh, some fabulous new companies and products, uh, they need to share in that success. That's not a normal way of rewarding people at a university, but if you want a successful innovation center, you've got to hire the best people you can find mm -hmm. from around the world. And they're going to need that kind of innovation, that kind of motivation to, to succeed. And if they do succeed, WITS will be happy as can be because you this, this will have been a successful program. Yeah. And I think, you know, therein lies one of our challenges in terms of how we turn a, 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 a hundred year old institution to start to do things differently. But I think we do have the, the sort of energy behind us in terms of doing that. Could I just ask a question around, um, um, and, and um, I guess it's around intellectual property, but uh, the question is, um, you've um, alluded to access to knowledge as critical to innovation but yet some knowledge is locked away in terms of proprietary or, or hidden information. And what do you think about the ideas around open science and open source? And could this drive innovation? It's a very difficult question to answer because if a company has put in, you get a good idea and a company pumps in a lot of money and now they want to, uh, Put in, the, put in the money and get the rewards and the investors be rewarded, they need to know for the next 20 years that they won't have competition competing with them directly. Um, that, so it's a, it's a very tough situation. When you work for a company and you file a patent, you don't own the patent, the company does. So I don't own those patents, I'm the inventor or one of the inventors on the patents, but I'm, I don't get any financial reward. And what you're saying is, is, is important. I, I've also found that many of the patents I have, uh, I thought other people would be close behind me, but I haven't had competition because my crazy background, I was getting into areas where no one else was close to me. And uh, the, having a patent or no patent, they, you know, there was no one close following me in many other areas. Uh, if you're the first there, that's very important. And, uh, you know, there's a rush to patent. Um, in the US, it used to be that you had to know when your idea occurred to get your patent. That was the date, the key date in a court case. Today, it's the date of filing, when you file your patent. And uh, it's handled by filing provisional patents. 
I've often filed patents uh, to get the early date where I just had uh, some notes and essentially had the attorneys file that. It was locked up and uh, that was the date of, uh, of our application. But it's, uh, it's a very tough one, Barry, because I, 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 at least I don't have an, an answer for that. Um, because if you have open source, then how do you reward the investors that are needed to make it happen? Yeah, um, I was, there's a question from Let Lotlo talking about um, to, to achieve the balance between problem solving and problem understanding in an innovative environment. So you, you, you clearly in your life, you've uh, done both really well. You've understood the problems and then you've solved them. But uh, do you see problem solving and problem uh, problem understanding as different things or part of the same? Uh, I've seen many situations where the problem definition was the problem. I mean, let me give you an example. Uh, uh, a company came to us with a problem of measuring very low leak rate on the package. It's, it was a nicotine inhaler, uh, foil on either side and the device was about the size of a cigarette filter. And uh, the way you used it was you uh, poked a hole in both ends and put it into a special holder and, and sucked on it like a cigarette. It's marketed today in many countries by J&J. &J. Uh, the problem was if that foil cap at either end leaked, uh, the nicotine would go to nicotinic acid and you weren't delivering the right drug because it was a, it was a, a drug replacement. They came to us with a problem of leak detection. And we were able to look at that and say, no, it's not leak detection. You don't care a damn about leak detection. You want to know if you've got a good seal or not. And just by saying that, the problem was solved because we could pull a slight vacuum and those foil ends would bulge. And as we uh, put slight pressure on, they'd go in. And so we had a quick way to measure uh, seal integrity. The leak rate that they were looking for was impossible. And I've seen many cases where people come to you with a problem, particularly from industry, and they've defined it incorrectly and made it insolvable. So an important part of your innovation center has to be Okay, someone comes to you with a problem and they tell you what the problem is. And you've got to ask enough questions to see if that's the right problem they're wanting solved. Or is it something different? And that could be a chemist, a physicist, a psychologist, it could be many different people in that team figuring out, no, you've asked the wrong question. This is the question that you really want to solve. They agree and then you're going to solve the right question. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't always mean you'll have a solution, but at least you'll have defined the problem correctly. And particularly with industry and people who come into you with problems in business, other things, they don't know how to define the problem correctly. They define it as the way they see it, not uh, in correct technical terms. Thank you. And then a question about that says, um, and it, it, it kind of notes that innovation is only lucrative when you realize success. So you you you, um, you 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 can make uh, money or achieve success from successful innovation, but uh, there's un until you do that, you need to survive and you need to keep going. And I I do understand that that uh, successful innovations are. Are, are kind of rarer than, than innovations that don't succeed. So um, kind of any advice to people who are wanting to be innovative and working at it, but um, have to, to, to sort of deal with the downsides and the upsides. Um, any advice to that? The way I've, I personally have handled this is I've worked primarily in, in different companies and I brought in research grants and funds or contract funds. So I've paid my way, so to speak. But, uh, and you've got to have a, a source of funds to pay your salary. 
and, and your staff salary. If you're in an innovation center, I couldn't think of anything more ideal. You've got a, a, a group that's paying your salary, at least for the next year, whatever it is, the, whatever the contract is the person has. And uh, yeah, you're under pressure to do something which is innovative and solve someone's problem. At the end of the year, you may be partway through a solution. You don't fire that person because they, they've got a lot of irons in the fire and some of them may work. Uh, your center will get better and better at judging the right problems to solve. You can't solve everyone's problem and some problems are just not solvable. But uh, you're right, you don't, innovators succeed when, they, uh, when the product is successful or when the problem has been solved. And some of them are, uh, you know, you don't get um, personal funds. We develop a mine detector for the US Army. Uh, I was the, I founded that company, I was the CEO. And we were, we had done something different in that company. Uh, when we started it, uh, they were concerned, the, the government was concerned that we were, uh, how would we able to keep good people in a small outfit? And I got all our employees to invest. Uh, to join our company, you had to invest $10,000. And uh, so we became employee owned and uh, went back to the government contracting people and said, you know, we're the most stable group of employees you're ever gonna find. Everyone here is an investor, it's significant. They better borrow the money uh, to invest in the company. They're gonna work like crazy to make this successful. Um, and you know, we got our, got our contract and we were able to succeed. In fact, in that company, uh, the 10,000 they put in Six years later, when we sold that company, they got 880,000. Made uh, about 26 people millionaires in the US. Mm. Uh, so there are other ways to, to find a way to do that, but you've got to have the financial support during that time. Your innovation center is, I think, the way to go. And be and judge people. If someone uh, is only having success, they're not going to innovate, as I said. You've got to have people who can stretch a little bit and uh, there's a failure and they stretch a bit more and they learn from their failures. You've got to learn from your failures. You make the same mistake twice, you know, you're out. But you know, so you've got to be, uh, got to be rational about that. Yeah. So um, we'll, we'll take just uh, one more question then I'm going to um, uh, um, call once more on the vice chancellor just to make some closing remarks. But a question about um, any tools, approaches, methodologies, systems thinking, anything that you are that you've used or aware of that helps support innovation, arts, uh, well, kind of outside of your 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 um, your instinct in terms of how to do it. Any advice on that? Could you repeat that again? I'm having trouble. Okay, there, there, there are many tools, approaches methodologies, things like systems thinking, systems approach, uh, design thinking. They, they, we, we, we kind of see a plethora of methodologies around supporting innovation. Have you any thoughts on those methodologies? Have you ever used methodologies? Or do you, is it uh, just your natural instinct that you draw on? I think it's more natural instinct. I read obviously a number of books on innovation It's something which has fascinated me. And the more I read and the more they try to put it in very narrow definitions, the more they, I feel they stifling innovation. Uh, innovators have to be free thinkers. You've got to be able to think. Uh, I find, I feel the last thing I want to know is how to innovate. I want to see a problem and think about it. And very often you think about a problem and you relax. I mentioned that water, water going into a, into a sink and water shooting up in my face. I was relaxed. I wasn't thinking of the problem and suddenly something happened and two came together. Very often it's just uh, everyday tasks. That was just washing the dishes. There have been other things just bottles going down a beverage line is very similar to traffic in uh, going down the highway and some of the problems and how we solve some of the other problems related to that and i've just mentioned a few in this talk came from 
just recognizing what happens when you drive a car and someone stops and uh, starts again and you may get a traffic jam at, or slow down at that point for the next two hours. Same happens on a, on, a, on a beverage line or a canning line when someone slows the line down and restarts. For some reason, the line goes unstable and it stays like that for hours. And it's that life experience of seeing those things. And, I, and it's just my personal perspective. I've never benefited from reading books about how to innovate it. I think everyone innovates differently. I've told you how I do it and other people do it differently. But I think you have to have the freedom to think and figure out what's best for you and judge it based on your success and your failures. And when you yeah. fail, figure out why you failed. What went wrong? What did I do wrong? How did this not work? What was my thinking wrong? What, what happened that occurred? So, and I think on uh, that word, I think we, we unfortunately have to end this fascinating discussion. But just to uh, have the final word, I'd like to call again on our Vice Chancellor, Professor Vilakazi, to uh, say a word of thanks. And, and um, a big thank you from me, David. It's been fascinating, as always, to listen to you. Uh, Professor Vilakazi, over to you. Thank you, uh, Barry. Uh, good evening once again. And uh, I promise you I won't be long, but I think I'd just like to say a few words in thanking um, our speaker. First, what I took from my take home, David, as an administrator, is that I must not, Barry, that's for you and Professor Morris, don't penalize innovators. You know, sometimes the Byzantine laws of universities don't allow for that rapid movement. And I think that has been a key uh, disenabler for innovation. And of course, uh, we must respect and acknowledge mavericks, those that actually don't follow common sense at all. And that is something that we have uh, uh, taken to heart. And once again, we also acknowledge, uh, David, your humility. Barry did mention earlier that uh, we as vets like to produce many like you. Uh, you are a fine example of what this university can produce and also, the fact that you mentioned and sent out the clarion call as the university tens hundred, we have now gone out of the silent phase of our campaign and uh, your endowment is the largest to have now triggered this sort of uh, innovative uh, ways of investing to the future of this university, this country and by extension this continent. And for that, we are uh, very grateful. This will ensure is a legacy that endures uh, beyond even the tenure of some of us who are incumbents in certain positions of uh, authority. I'd like to thank uh, Barry for being a very effective, flexible, and accommodative uh, program director. Uh, professors Lynn Morris and uh, Nithya Chetty, who are really the key architects in this whole concept, supported by Barry of, of, of innovation. Nithya has been uh working very hard at driving the uh, concept of um, you know even even at an academic level and uh, that lean too when she joined the university uh, appointed Barry and Barry actually has been really putting his wheels behind uh, the shoulder the, his shoulders behind the wheel so I think Lynn Barry and Nikki is not here thank you very much you've really given us the appropriate uh, intellectual input to this project that as you know uh, has been given a few nuggets of thought that I'm sure you'll implement as you go forward. I think this would not have been possible without many members of the hardworking and committed university admin departments, uh, the communicate the comms team, the uh, fundraising team, and, and, and outreach team, uh, the uh, marketing team as well. And I'd like to thank, you know, Rachelle, who actually, and team uh, for really uh, staging this show, show this afternoon. And uh, from the US board of uh, uh, foundation board, uh, I see Nushin. Nushin, thank you very much. Uh, I'm sure that uh, you'll be our liaison person in trying to really get this uh, appropriately actioned and actually getting this uh, process uh, going forward. 
And I've got staff in my office, in my own office with the vice chancellor, who have been helping me, me in, uh, you know, working on this program. Um, and also, I'd like to thank all the various directors, I'm not mentioning them by name, of all the divisions in the administrative team that have helped, that have helped us. Uh, the key participants, you really have added intellectual rigor and stimulus to this conversation by posing questions that have helped uh, us hear and take advice from David as to how we can really get our innovation off the ground and uh, avoid some of the pitfalls that uh, have uh, uh, we have faced before. I'm speaking here as a failed uh, inventor and innovator, David. That's why I started into academia and became an ossified middle-aged uh, administrator. I tried a few things when I came back from Geneva postdoc in app, uh, some apps, and they were wonderful. Uh, we were involved in the early development of the grid or the cloud, and it never got commercialized. And it was a series of failures when I realized that I must stick to my lane, which is research and now administration. So I'm a proud failure in that regard, I'm sure, but I can create through your donation an enabling environment for those who are better talented and able and better inclined than I am. And I'm sure that applies to Lean as well in innovation. Uh, so thank you for that. Uh, finally, as I close, I'd like to once again thank uh, the family of the uh, David and um, Angela Fine for their uh, um, generous uh, contribution to this uh, establishment of the uh, uh, Vest in in Innovation Center Week. With those few words, I thank you and wish you well, and thank you very much. And good night, good morning, good day, good evening. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, David. Thank you very much, David. Fabulous. Bye. Thank you, David. <laughs>